Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. This is the second part of our look at the last year in the life of Brian Epstein. And we managed to get towards the end of 1966. Uh, We started off at Candlestick Park, but his life was still very much uh, packed towards the end of of 1966. And there's a a couple of things going on. He's been in out of the the, the Priory. He's been traveling with the Beatles. He's been in the US with uh, Georgie Fame. Um, There's two maybe notable things that are going on as well. At the end of October, a close friend of his dies, Al McCogan. And there's a bit of, it kind of adds to the general air of sadness and, you know, around Brian. Yes. So for those people that don't know, Al McCogan uh, was a singer who had had a very high profile career in the UK in the late 50s, um, sort of really into 1960, 1961. The Beatles ironically, probably contributed to the decline in her career as she was seen as being a bit passe Mm. um, by then. But she had a very, very close friendship with um, Brian Epstein and um, also with John Lennon. And Lennon uh, commented that, you know, as teenagers, they used to mock Al McCogan. They used to make fun of her um, when she would appear on, on television very unhip character but actually when they got to know her um you know she became part of their circle and there there were rumors that um john had an affair with her at one point um, mm-hmm. so just and she was she was known the as list. the girl with the giggle in her voice isn't that the right the girl with the giggle in her voice she had a, she had a sort of very affecting uh, vocal style my father big fan of al McCogan. um which indicates indicates perhaps just how on hip uh, she <laughs> she she was. Sorry, Dad. But, but even even though does he listen? He doesn't listen. No. Even though um, even though Al McCogan is kind of painted as this figure from the previous generation of showbiz, she's still only in her early thirties, and she she she's in her early thirties. She gets a diagnosis of cancer, and she 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 dies on tour in in, in Scandinavia. Yes, I mean she was big in Sweden. Um, mm. it, she she was the highest paid female performer. Uh, that probably means she got seven and six, mind you. But um, <laughs> uh, she was the highest paid female performer in the UK between 1950 and 1960. She, as her star waned slightly in the UK, she had number one hits in in Sweden and, and Norway and Scandinavia. Um, there, there were suggestions that she and Brian were romantically involved or that uh, possibly there was a marriage being talked about. She lived with her mother. She mm. was Jewish. She was a, a you know, perfect fit, uh, except for the fact that Brian was gay. Um, but it was seen as a marriage of convenience. It was these a, kind would of have been a marriage floated. of convenience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this affected him uh, uh, very, very deeply. Yeah, so that, that's very sad. That's on the 26th of October. As we spill into November, the main thing that Brian is known for, which is being the man behind the Beatles, it spills over into the real world that there's news stories and appearances that relate to the fact of, well, where is this band? What is going on? And, you know, it's quite normal nowadays for a band to take two or three months off or even longer. Um, But at the time, it seemed... You know, the news would have been out that there's no Beatles album for Christmas. There's no Beatles single for Christmas. They haven't gone back into the studio yet. John is off recording uh, or making this film. Um, you know, there are fans demonstrating outside Brian's house wanting another Beatles tour. Uh, yes. And Brian kind of confirms that the, the, the actual Beatles are not under any record contract by November 1966, as it happens. Yes, it's a very strange situation. Um, you, you know, we're back to this kind of Schrodinger's Beatles. You know, they, they the contract has expired with EMI. They are negotiating around yeah. this. And, you know, Brian, you know, obviously they're in a much stronger position than they were uh, as unknowns. Um, Beatles fans in the UK are upset uh, because there has been no final UK tour. Mm. 
So, to say goodbye, um, so to speak. Yeah, to kind of say goodbye. So America, uh, the rest of the world, the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera, they've, they've had their 1966 tour. This doesn't happen. I mean, I think their last UK appearance is in May uh, at a sort of NME poll winners, con- winners concert, which um, for reasons of Brian failing to agree terms is not actually film the cameras yeah, the, whole, the whole concert is filmed except for yeah, the Beatles for the, which is for the, very frustrating the, there, are, there are demonstrations outside his house um, he goes on to the David Frost program uh, on the 11th of November 1966 but he's made it very clear ahead of time he's not going to take questions about the Beatles touring nor about the Beatles splitting up because this is the point at which uh, from here all the way through to June 67 when Sgt Pepper is Revealed, uh, mm. it it the, the the questions are oh the band splitting up what are they doing you know and they're all doing did, their own thing. What and did David Frost ask him a lot of questions about Tommy quickly probably probably I mean probably <laughs> you know that was uh, in the Beatles the burning, house. Issue. <laughs> burning issue of the day was when is Tommy quickly's new single coming out. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are other labels there. Ep- Epstein, you get a sense that Epstein really doesn't want to go to another label. That, that, yeah. Um, the extent to which he's speaking to other labels or other labels or he, he's referencing other labels is really to leverage um, his, his negotiations with the MI. You, you know, uh, it's, it's a winning formula. It is a winning formula, yeah. Everybody, well, it's all very well for us to be sitting here, you know, 50 odd years later. Um, everybody at this point thinks the Beatles are going to split up. Yeah. Or the touring has stopped, or the next big thing is Herman's Hermits, or the next big thing is the Monkees. And the Beatles at this point, you know, have always been saying, well, it's maybe two or three years, you know, John and I'll keep writing songs. Um, you know, I'm going to open, I, I want to be two hairdressers. You know, it, it, it's... <laughs> but well, you, no, you're right. Hindsight is twenty twenty vision. Yeah. And uh, the main commentary that would have gone along with the Beatles, you have to imagine, at the time... When, when you see something this big get as big as it gets, is to ask the corresponding question of, well, when does it stop? Yes. When does it, when does it change? When, when, when is the drop? And that would have been a very excellent time to ask that question right at the end of 66. Yes. And I think that's the speculation for the next six months will be, uh, are they going to split up? Um, is this the end? There's, 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 uh, you know, what will happen is we'll have a single that doesn't get to number one for the first time yeah. uh, since 19, 19, 1963 in the UK. So um, the Beatles are on the wane. Uh, the touring receipts haven't been great in America. They've upset people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it is, you know, if someone had sat you down in 1966 and said, uh, I'll give you all the Beatles rights going forward for a million pounds, you might have been thinking, well, don't know. Yeah. Do I cash in or not? Yeah. There is a fun little news story, though, in the midst of all of this. So it's it's November 66 and there is this question of the Beatles being up for grabs. And who do we notice? Mr. Klein. Mr. Alan Klein appears in a story uh, in the Sunday Telegraph on the 13th of November 1966. And what does it say exactly? Well, essentially, it says that two of the band, two unnamed members of the Beatles, um, have made an approach to Alan Klein about uh, possible management deal. Hmm. Um, so Brian dismisses the story as ridiculous. Yes. Um, George and Ringo are said to be disturbed. John is annoyed. Paul is out of the country. So you ask the question, one, is it true or not? If it's true, which two Beatles was it? Was it Paul? Who knows? Or the flip side is, did Klein just plant the story himself? Bit of well, divide and conquer. Would would Klein do that sort of thing? I, I uh, yeah, uh, yeah, he would. Yeah, I think he would. <laughs> um, I, 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 I actually think that um, I actually think it was probably Paul and Ringo. Really? No, so I just, <laughs> I just think that way. <laughs> I, I, I mean, just, we could ask them. We could. I think it's another. I think it's one of those questions that when Paul comes on. Uh, to the podcast and yes. everyone's expecting us to say, you know, I, I, I read somewhere, I heard somewhere that you kind of dreamt the melody to yesterday. And it was, a, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't the original name or tell us the story about, um, you know, John liking that line and Hey Jude about the parrot being on your shoulder, that kind of thing. We're, we're not going to go there. We're, we're going to say, <laughs> did you in late, uh, 
uh, 65, 66, were you reaching out to uh, Alan, Alan Klein? Klein? And he'll still tell us the story about um, yesterday. Anyway, um, he what does happen at the end of November is that the Beatles do go back into the studio and unbeknownst to the wider world just yet is that they are working on Strawberry Fields Forever when I'm 64 and Penny Lane this side of Christmas. So the Beatles, as far as the Beatles are concerned, are still the Beatles and there's work to be done and time will tell how that all works out. Um, And because time is linear, 66 becomes 1967. And there's a couple of things that we should think about in relation to, to Brian. Something that we touched upon in part one, but perhaps we should just mention a little bit more uh, as we look you know head into 1967 is Brian's drug use and this has been a continuous issue throughout all of his management years yes yes um so really after i don't know whether we can say the beatles in- introduced him to preludin prellies uh, yep. These kind of uppers, but certainly from from the time his early days of his management career, he is taking this drug. Uh, doesn't require a prescription. It's perfectly fine, yep. perfect, perfectly legal, um, but uh, perhaps not particularly well advised. But uh, yeah, so he's he's taking this, and certainly the Beatles are, have taken this since their their Hamburg days. Um, Peter Brown, in his book uh, "The Love You Make," and Again, that's a book written with a particular market in mind. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it's particularly kind of scandalous or it's kind of um, famously Paul and Linda burnt their copy that was uh, sent to them by Peter Brown that sundered their relationship. Um, he talks about Brian taking pills all the time and he recounts that even at parties Brian would kind of <clears throat> laugh up his sleeve or put his hand up to his mouth and he knew he always knew that this was Brian taking another pill um so it was just a it was almost a kind of daily occurrence mm-hmm. um and also by this stage he's become dependent on carbramol mm-hmm. but it's it's a it's a barbiturate so it's a kind of sedative uh, so he's he's taking pills to make him sleep he's taking pills to wake him up he's uh he's just becoming addicted and you you, you mentioned that back in in san francisco you know when the briefcase is stolen by by Diz gillespie it's not so much the money it's not so much the contracts it's the fact that the briefcase has got contained the illegal drugs. barbiturates yeah um so it's, it, it's very much a pill existence that brian is is living in so the beatles are moving into you know marijuana and lsd and we do know that brian took those drugs but yes. he's he's very much in this cultural Mother's Little Helper type vibe of drugs to get up, drugs to get down, popping pills. And I don't want to say it was culturally accepted, but certainly a song like Mother's Little Helper would give you an indication that there was a, 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 you know, it wasn't an uncommon way of life. Yeah, I think I think that that song in particular is a kind of. Uh, you know, it's it's holding a mirror up to middle class society that is being critical of pop stars like Jagger and the, the Stones and the Beatles taking, you know, smoking pot or taking LSD. And they're kind of saying, well, you know, in straight, inverted commas, society, you're, you're all popping pills and that's perfectly legal and that's fine. But, you know, it's like that argument, well, Paul is always advancing or in the past has always advanced, you know, well, smoking a joint, it's no worse than drinking a couple of glasses of whiskey or something like that. But yeah, Brian, I think, is 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 in more of that pill popping uh, side of the drug culture. Now, he is, you know, he smoked pot. There's very mm-hmm. funny stories of him in the Delmonico Hotel where Bob Dylan supposedly introduces them to pot, which yeah. doesn't really. But, um, you know, with Brian getting incredibly high and just staring, staring at himself in a mirror and laughing and pointing at his reflection and going, Jew, Jew, and laughing hysterically. And, you know, um, or that he's taking uh, LSD. But you get a sense that perhaps, you know, if he wasn't hanging out with the Beatles, he wouldn't be taking LSD mm. necessarily. No, he wouldn't. Yeah. Unless, unless he went, had shared a dentist, possibly. <laughs> um, so drug use is one of the main reasons that he, he does weave in and out of the Priory in the last year yeah. of his life. His other addiction is gambling. Yes, yes. And again, you kind of think this is part of the impresario image. You know, it's a bit like that that scene in Hard Day's Night where you kind of, you know, it's all people in tuxedos yeah. and bow ties and uh, 
Well, it's seen as posh, this kind of yeah, posh it's a, gambling. Yeah, it's a kind of, yeah, this is not bingo on Blackpool Pier or slot machines. <laughs> this or, is not like one of those commercials that you see on no. daytime television for... Foxy bingo. bingo. No. Foxy. <laughs> <laughs> Our new sponsor. <laughs> Yeah, it's not like that. It's it's kind of uh, you, you know smoke fooled. It's it's James Bond. It's uh, yeah, exclusive it's, clubs, money to yeah, get in, money yeah. to burn, kind of thing. Yeah, that it's a sign of success almost to be gambling like. Well, no, because we have we have evidence that um, the good, um, the sensible Mr. Paul McCartney would have occasionally been to the gambling clubs as well. I'm yes. sure he had a very sensible approach to I'm going to bet my twenty pounds and then I'm I, going to go home. You, yeah, you can't. I really can't see Paul. It seems so unlikely. But you think it is part of Paul's upwardly mobile improving? Oh, yes, yes. It's one of those things where he'd he'd imagine himself as this kind of person who stands by a, a roulette wheel. And um, cast some chips in the air. Well, and let, let's, let's face it. We've all imagined ourselves as James Bond at some time. Um, and, yeah. Uh, Doing the paperwork. The paperwork side of the job is the bit I imagine. But anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I've been to Las Vegas twice. Um, and you do. You walk in and you kind of think, this is an impossibly glamorous thing. And then you realize, I don't know how to play. I don't know how to shoot. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how to play poker or shoot craps or you know none of this. Uh, Give me give me a dollar coin and a slot machine. That that'll do. Um, But yeah, Paul Paul recounts uh, you know the the Epstein's favorite club, and again, it's a kind of clubby uh, Mm. vibe to this. Is uh, Curzon House, and uh, it's Paul says he often ran into Epstein, which kind of again creates the impression that Paul is always in there. But you think it's more a case of any time that Paul was there, Epstein was there. So yes, Epstein is always there. And um, he says he once saw Brian put a cigarette lighter uh, up as a bat. And he said this was a Dunhill cigarette lighter worth £100, which is uh, in, in today's money. Should you have need for a Dunhill cigarette lighter, it would cost you over £2,000. And Gosh. just lose it on a turn of a card. Strange existence. Again, another one of these kind of private existences of that, that Brian had. But possibly the oddest thing he does is at the start of 1967, um, he, he seeks to get you know, a license to show films at the Savile Theatre, which is a venture with Robert Stigwood. But yeah. uh, on the 13th of January, he makes this deal with Robert Stigwood, which yes. is the strangest, maddest thing ever. It is. So this is effectively... It's difficult to know how to describe this, um, you, you know, because Stigwood talks about it in comes at it from one side of things and talks about it in a particular set of terms, Epstein in another. Um, but essentially, it's a merger on paper of of the Robert Stigwood organization and NAMS. And we we've talked before, uh, you know, not repeat it. We talked about Robert Stigwood, and mm. um, you know, he's already been through a bankruptcy situation but he's kind of involved with the who and he has a roster of of artists and uh, you know i suppose their rivals maybe rso uh, and names maybe on paper it makes sense to bring all of this together it, it's building an empire um the the one thing they do have in common is that i think each organization is absolutely identified with its chief executive, you know, with its its owner. Yes. So NAMS yeah. is Brian Epstein is NAMS. Robert Stigwood organization is Robert Stigwood. And and they're very strong characters. They're very larger than life characters. And they are completely different and completely incompatible. Essentially, Brian is, Brian's got the biggest group in the world. And he's decided that, yeah, he's just going to merge with somebody who is not managing the biggest group in the world. And Robert Stigwood is somebody who the Beatles, we've mentioned this before, they've 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 had experience of him. They're not fans of his. He's about to embark on a phenomenally successful decade, and we cover this in our Sgt. Pepper the movie episode, because he uh you know he he works with um, Eric Clapton and Cream and the Bee Gees and uh, you know he's 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 really in terms of success he's going to deliver. That's yeah. Yeah. that's not beyond doubt. But what we've also said before is that he didn't really have the maybe the, the, the love or the taste that Brian brought into the management procedures. He was a bit of a, a blunt object, Robert Stigwood. Uh, 
I think that's exactly it. You know, Brian is coming at this. He ha- he has an artistic sensibility. Um, he has a very personal relationship uh, with, with the Beatles. Um, Stigwood is very ambitious. He's a businessman. It's pound shillings and pence. You know, it's, 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 he's yeah. very, very focused. And, you know, arguably, that's what you need if you want to run a successful business. And perhaps it is the case that Brian is, is recognizing his own limitations, that once you get to a certain point, you get to a certain size um, of, of business, um, you need somebody to come in and run the business while Brian yes. can take care of the kind of personal management side of things. And it was always the case, according to Brian, the Beatles would remain his, Scylla Black would remain his, um, Jerry Marsden, he, he, he was embarking on a solo career and Brian had a relationship with him. And basically, Stigwood would take care of everything else. We'd take care of the, the, the business side of the business, um, the day-to-day stuff that Brian really didn't have time for. But you've highlighted before, Brian fundamentally is a man that cannot delegate. Mm. And there, yeah, there's certainly a logic in bringing in somebody with a skill set like Robert Stigwood who can run things. But you'd kind of think if, if you're holding the cards of the Beatles, you'd be saying, you're going to work for me and here's how it's going to do. Instead of giving him a deal where essentially Stigwood had the option to buy out Brian and own the Beatles after a couple of months. Yes, this is the weirdest aspect of the transaction. And it does kind of give you an idea of just how differently Stigwood saw things from Epstein. So it's this classic thing where you put people in a room, they, 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 they shake hands on something, they each leave thinking they've got something which is completely different. And, and, and you know, whether, whether they're talking at cross purposes. But anyway, we have a, a, a statement from Stigwood. Now, bear in mind, Stigwood has an agenda and Stigwood is, sure, is sure. writing after the fact. So he, he says, we'd be joint managing directors together. Brian would give me an option. I think it was for six months. If I paid him 500,000 uh, at the end of six months, the controlling shares would be transferred to me and my company. In other words, I would control the company, that's names, including the Beatles. Brian received a letter saying that I was taking up the option. We had a wonderful dinner, laughed and joked about the future and talked. He was thrilled. So Stigwood has been given the option to buy basically the remainder of Brian's shares. And we touched on the the breakdown of the shareholding um, uh, earlier uh, in the previous episode. But the key thing here is that Brian apparently did not discuss this arrangement with anybody. No, nobody so in NEMS and nobody in NEMS knew. It's, he seems to have gone com- completely on a a solo run, and um, you know, presumably he had his uh, uh, famous uh, sidekick lawyer David Jacobs um, <laughs> to do all the deals for him. But uh, yeah, he seems not to have confided in the top people around him within the NEMS organisation. And and the author, Ray Connolly, says that Brian knew almost immediately he had made a huge mistake. Yes. Um, which is a bit of an understatement that, you know, it, 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 as a, again, with somebody who holds the cards of the Beatles, to put yourself into a position that you can't reverse out of is madness, really. He seems to have realised that he and uh, Stigwood just weren't compatible. And uh, Connolly tells one story where... Uh, and again, this is Stigwood maybe just kind of trolling mm. Brian slightly. Um, Brian arrives and Stigwood has parked his Rolls Royce in Brian's mm. car parking space. Mm. So immediately do there's kind of jostling for position and this kind of just little niggles and things like that. And uh, Brian completely, uh, y- you know, loses the head over this, gets very angry about this car. And then subsequently he sees that someone fans have slashed the roof. It's a convertible Rolls Royce that have slashed the roof. And he's very happy about this. He's very pleased <laughs> that Stigwood's Rolls Royce has been uh, vandalized in this way. So uh, immediately they're clashing, they're jostling for position. Stigwood is ordering people about within the NEMS organization. You know, again, this is, he's, he says to Alistair Taylor, you've got to go to America with cream. Taylor mm-hmm. is saying, well, I'm not doing this if, if Brian Epstein doesn't tell me to go. Epstein tells him, no, absolutely, you mustn't go. Then comes back on the phone saying, Alistair, you'll have a ball in San Francisco. <laughs> have a great time. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's, it 
adds to the confusion. There are no clear lines of communication. Yeah. There are no sort of line management structures within NEMS. Um, and, and they're just constantly crossing each other. As if January the 13th wasn't a busy enough day signing that deal with Robert Stigwood, uh, Brian ends the day by seeing uh, Jimi Hendrix at the Bag of Nails Club. That's pretty cool. Yes, that was just um, a, 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 a ease, ease, ease your way out of, out of the day. <laughs> have you ever have you, have you ever been to have you ever seen the size of those places? It's very tiny, They're very tiny, very tiny, tiny, tiny. Yeah, tiny. Yeah. I mean, uh, the last time I was in London, I went to uh, I think it was Scotch of St James, yeah. uh, into the basement where uh, there was a band playing, and uh, you know it's like the size of your living room. It's uh, <laughs> well, could, it could, is very small. It could only hold two or three hundred people. Uh, two days later, Brian is in the slightly larger Royal Albert Hall to see Donovan Ray. Well, you can see that that would be what the, you would rather relax in the company of uh, Donovan <laughs> than uh, in. I have to say, I would rather relax in the Albert Hall with Donovan than uh, the bag of nails with bag Hendrix. Of nails with, yeah, possibly. But the big thing that happens at the end of January is the Beatles finally sign a nine-year contract with EMI. This is sort of Brian's one of Brian's last big gifts yes. and jobs yes. for the band. Yes. Um, so this is a very interesting contract, and again. Uh, just uh, we mentioned Alan Klein being in London and being in the background. Um, you know, Klein has been brought in specifically by Andrew Lou Goldham to negotiate uh, with the record company, and uh, he does a great deal, gets a lot of publicity. So there, there is pressure. But basically, um, there was a six-month period where they were operating on a sort of ad hoc arrangement. January '67, they signed this new deal. They get ten percent of the retail price of their records, which is the highest royalty rate at the time. Mm. And then this is the interesting point. Um, it's for a nine year period, which takes us up to 1975, 76. Yes, they that's have, a long period. It is a long period of time, but they have to provide over a nine year period, 70 songs. Which is not a lot of songs. It is by not Beatles standards. a lot of songs by Beatles standards. Remember, we're going to get the White Album that has 30 songs on it. Yeah. So, um, you know, a couple of double albums and uh, five singles. That would be that would be it. Yeah, a bit, 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 yeah, back, back of the envelope calculations. What, 13 tracks on Pepper, 11 tracks on the Magical Mystery Tour. That's your 24 plus 30 from the White Album. That's your 54. Um, even without Get Back, Let It Be, you throw on Abbey Road and we're done. Yeah. So, and this, is good the, and this is this is this is the point. This is this is a contract that uh, you know they could easily have fulfilled within a couple of years. And th these are for songs as the Beatles or solo. So once you start throwing in, uh, you know, uh, nine or ten tracks off two versions, well, there you go. That's EMI. I've got what they paid for. <laughs> well, um, well, there's a couple of questions though that arise though. Uh, I guess. Um, but that's not saying as soon as they delivered the seven, the 70 songs, they were out. It was no. nine years with a minimum of 70 songs. Yes. So once once they had delivered 70 songs, they were con were not contractually obliged to deliver anything else to right. EMI. But by the same token, during that nine year period, they could not go off and record for RCA or DACA or anybody else. So it effectively prevents them the, from EMI's point of view, the big gain is it prevents the Beatles or any of the solo Beatles going off and signing or recording for another record label until the nine years are up. And this is the contract that in September 69, Klein renegotiates the rate on yes. uh, just before the release of Abbey Road. So I wonder, is that on the back of you've had your 70 songs? I wonder, was that one of his negotiating con um, Yes. Yeah. I mean, that... that Absolutely. That is that is something that, you, you know, um, you, you think by the time that comes around, John and Yoko are putting out albums, George is putting out solo albums. Um, the EMI know that they're not going to be getting two albums mm. a year and four singles uh, from, from the beat. They can just stop. Um, nor is there, any, you know, this will come up in, again, Paul references this in the context of the, the Beatles' reaction to Stigwood coming in and saying, I'm going to exercise the option and I'm going to uh, uh, be your manager. And Paul says, well, we'll just record God Save the Queen. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, in different versions for the next, until we fulfilled our contract. So Stigwood knows that it's a 70 years, sorry, 70, 70 song 
uh, contract. So the possibility exists of the Beatles just downing tools, you know, recording 70 songs and saying, that's it. Or they could not put anything out in the 60s and just record 70 songs in 1975. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's a kind of weird, uh, it, it is a kind of weird deal. It does give more control to the Beatles over what gets released, because from this point onwards, uh, I know we get the American Magical Mystery Tour album, but essentially the US-UK disparity yep. of reissues disappears. The the issues of the, of the Beatles albums become international uh, and standard, more or less, at this point. And they have that control over 76, because once you get to 76, you have all these crazy Beatle compilations yeah, start coming out yeah, again. Yeah. Um, so what they, they do have that control, which is... A good thing, considering Sgt. Pepper is in the pipeline, that that's going to be a global release. It is. And I think I think all of this, you've got to kind of see by this stage, they know what Sar- they kind of know what Sgt. Pepper is going to be. They 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 want control that the, you, you've got the cover is iconic. If it wasn't if it was different in every marketplace in the world. That would be a bad thing. So, yeah, I, I think this is a good contract. It's a good royalty rate. It gives the Beatles control. And it, it provides the, basically, as you say, the platform from which Alan Klein um, uh, renegotiates. As if January wasn't busy enough, NEMS at the end of January have plans to produce a pilot TV show starring The Who. Now, that would have been great if that had been an actual thing. That would have been fantastic. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of, this is going to be, what, like a sitcom starring the who, who? like the monkeys yeah. this is this is like the monkeys but yeah. with the who um do, do you know the young ones of course i know the of young course ones. you know the young ones i imagine it would be like that so you kind of who's got, who you know keith moon is yes. uh, uh vivian you know he's always kind of blowing stuff up and smashing yep. the place up and, and all the rest of it uh mike is the kind of uh, Roger Daltrey, you know, the kind Sensible of hard, hard man, uh, grinded, um, and uh, Neil, the hippie. I think that would be Ant Whistle, the kind of okay. tall, brooding, quiet one. And then uh, Pete Townsend uh, is uh, Rick, the people's, the people's poet. poet. People's poet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you imagine trying to corral the Who into the monkeys format? Um, it certainly would be good <laughs> do you think do you think been, peter peter jackson could just cgi the who into all those episodes of the peter monkeys peter jackson and his artificial intelligence machine um and then at the end of january brian and the beatles go to the savile theater to see the who and jimi hendrix uh, performing together another grand night out that would be a great night out um while uh, the beatles beaver away in the background on sergeant pepper um brian is doing various things. He buys a, a big house out in the country called Kingsley Hill House. Yeah. Um, this is his country country mansion. Yes. But again, you, you get a sense this is, you know, you've got a lovely townhouse because you're in London doing all the cultural things in London, but you also have to have a weekend retreat. Yeah. Um, in March, uh, Robert Stigwood signs the Bee Gees, who are to be his Beatles for the next uh, number of years. Yeah. Um, Brian goes off to Mexico on a holiday in March. And NEMS is active uh, at the end of March, signing with the Monkeys, who are the hot new band, uh, to present their three London shows. Later yeah. So, in the so summer. again, NEMS, as well as having its own roster, they're they're acting as uh, you know promoters. Um, yeah. For 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 other bands, uh, so the Monkeys um, are signed up, and uh, perhaps that's when the Who pilot sitcom that they decided no, we will not <laughs> not to do it. We'll not well, do that. The Monkeys had passed through the UK on promo at the end of January '67, and. Um, you know, they, they had fallen into the orbit of the Beatles. Yeah. So that seems to have been where Brian and Nems started to interact with the monkeys back in, in January. And uh, the Savile Theatre is still a going concern. And who's there at the end of April doing a big, long residency? You'd have been there every night. It's Donovan. Donovan, the one and only. He's, he's uh, tick him off again on the list. <laughs> um, but the big... Uh, thing uh, that has also happened in the interim uh, back in February, March is the release of Strawberry Fields' Penny Lane. So the Beatles are starting to resurface. You know, the Strawberry Fields' Penny Lane is the first release under that new contract. People have a rough idea that the Beatles have not gone away, um, but we are still waiting for the release of Sgt. Pepper, which is the big cornerstone event of 1967. And we will talk about it after this break. End of part one. Intermission. End of intermission.
part two. Welcome back. So the big ticket event that is due to happen is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which originally is due to be released on June the 1st, 1967. And as we recounted just before the break, that Brian has reorganised his NEMS enterprise. He has got the Beatles re-signed to EMI. Um, he is in and out of the Priory and he is buzzing around doing lots of different things in London. But the Beatles will always remain his main charge. And so as we head into May 1967, all guns are pointed towards Sergeant Pepper, really, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, uh, again, this is an album which takes longer than any other uh, to record. Um, there are issues around the cover. Uh, and this, So Brian is involved in a business sense, but the, the, the music, this is very clear. This is the Beatles. This is George Martin. Brian is not part of that uh, sort of hands-on day-to-day. There's no tour coming up. There's no single coming off this album. These are not decisions that have to be made. Um, Brian is coping with stay good mm-hmm. he is um it's around this time in may that he formally enters into an arrangement with Nemperer. uh so they sign basically the two companies the american and the british company sign a contract where they will represent each other's interests in their relevant jurisdictions and again this is sort of a favor to nat weiss um the lawyer and you get a sense that this is maybe because Stigwood is potentially about to take over that that Brian is locking this in yeah. as a favor for Nat Weiss before um before that happens the, uh, the other thing as you say is when he's not on holiday he's in the priory mm. and he's actually in the priory again in May 67 yes and yes um he's so they 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 they're coming up to the release of pepper there's going to be a launch party Brian, this is this is where Brian comes into his own. You know, it's the courting of the press, it's the the theatricality of launching the product, and this is this is the, this is what he loves. He knows this album is going to be, uh, you know, a blockbuster. He knows this is something different. Um, it's such a leap forward, and he wants he's presenting it again. It's that role of impresario. Uh, and it's something we take for granted a little bit that the album is launched because every album gets launched these days, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but the Beatles were not going on tour, as Paul would say, oh, we'll put the album on tour and Sgt. Pepper can be yeah. banned, et etc. et cetera. Anyway, but if anyone is familiar with the Sgt. Pepper album, and we discussed this in our Sgt. Pepper album episode, there is this launch party in Brian's house in Belgravia, which is not a, a common occurrence. And the notion is that all the press can come to Brian's house. The Beatles are in Brian's house. Um, I'm imagining if you're listening to this podcast, you're familiar with some of the photos of that day, some of them famously yeah. taken by Linda McCartney, because it's one of the... Um, Paul has just met Linda the previous within the previous week, and he's talking to her at the party as a, as a photographer. And the band have not really been interacting with the press since those rather sullen US press conferences on the tour the previous August. So it's the first time, apart from being doorstepped at Abbey Road, that the press yes. can officially interact with the Beatles, see them together, and any kind of anxiety that might have been bubbling around at the end of 66, if it hadn't been put away by Strawberry Fields Forever Penny Lane, here is a unified front with Brian very much front and centre, organising this debutante's ball, so to speak, for the album in his house with the band. And it's a big deal. It is a big deal. And, I mean, you know, if we kind of unpack a few things there, it's in Brian's house. Yeah. Why? Why? It's, you know, it's not in a hotel. It's not in Abbey Road Studios. It's in Brian's house. So it's a very personal undertaking for him. As you say, this is a kind of, this is described as um, a new initiative in pop promotion. So, uh, again, you don't have these listening parties. Mm. You know, where if, uh, this, this is a new thing. You know, get, you get the press to come in and you play them the record. And it's in Brian's house. And all four Beatles are there. Um, they've not been in a room together with the press uh, since uh, late 66. Ray Coleman says Lennon looked different. He looked haggard. He looked old. He looked ill, clearly under the influence of drugs. What what they mean is he's thin. Yes. <laughs> Physically don't look the same. They are thinner. They have moustaches. They, they look 
older. The next day, the entire album, except for A Day in the Life, mm-hmm. how disappointing would that be, <laughs> is played by uh, Kenny Everett on, uh, not on Radio 1, on the BBC Light programme. Oh. So you're still... We still didn't have still, Radio 1. We still didn't have Radio 1. Yeah. Unofficially, the, the day before, the entire album, including A Day in the Life, had been uh aired on pirate radio and again there's something slightly subversive about that as well you kind of give the pirate stations an advanced copy yeah uh, kenny everett gets to play it the day after which is going to coincide with the um news stories and the reports of the uh, launch party uh the day before so it's a it's a very coordinated uh, pr campaign and yet, of a sort uh, which is completely innovative uh now it's commonplace there's there's, there's kind of two odd things one is that Brian leaves the Priory to actually get back to his house for the party, so he's not even yes, getting yes. ready for it. He's 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 slightly absent in the in the preamble, and he's he doesn't go back to the Priory until um, May the twenty first because he's he's out at Ringo's house the following day on the on the twentieth. So th- this is you check out. You know, I'm I'm in for a rest. I'm in for a drug cure. Sorry, I have to kind of go and host a, uh, a, an album launch party for Sgt. Pepper on, on, on the 19th. On the 20th, sorry, I have to go and have tea at Ringo's house with George and John. <laughs> and then and after having tea, he goes back to the Priory. But then the next day, he comes out of the Priory because he has to go and have tea with his mum and dad. <laughs> and the, you know, it, it is, it it's is like weird. It's like a hotel. And the other thing that's bookending that week in the, in the news or in the background is that the Beatles are signing up for the R World TV special at the end of June, the which yes. becomes the All You Need Is Love type event. And so the contracts for that are assigned just before the launch party in Brian's house. And it's very much a Brian plan that the Beatles do this TV programme. It is, it is. I mean, Brian can see the value of this, the, the kind of publicity aspect of this. And again, it's it's him back in control. It's him setting things up for the boys. It's him looking after them, managing the career, managing the publicity, making sure they're in front of the public, making sure their career is moving forward. So it's very much Brian's idea. And there is a sense that when they found out what was happening and what they'd been signed up to, they weren't particularly happy. Yeah. You know, if you signed if you signed me up to do a live podcast in front of uh, 500 million people, I, I would not be particularly keen that you hadn't discussed that in <laughs> advance, you know? Well... To be coming off the back of a very big album to say, listen, just one more thing in three or four weeks yeah. time, global television audience of about 200 million. Could you write a new hit single? That'd be great. That's essentially what they're being asked to do. Yeah. Some pressure there. <laughs> some some pressure. pressure. And that news is officially leaked or not. It's let out to the news on May the 22nd. So, you know, you have the album coming out. You also have news stories coming out that beyond this, the Beatles have a, a new, you know, a new project at the end of June that they've signed up for. And as it happens, Sgt. Pepper gets Rush released a week early because the 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 buzz is so good. We start to get confusion in the timelines and the kind of official histories. When did Sgt. Pepper come out? Come out on the... 1st of June. It actually comes out on the 22nd of May. Brian has checked out of the Priory yeah. uh, the day before. Then post that release on the 26th of May, on the 28th, Brian hosts a big party at the new house at uh, Kinsley Hill. Um, so this is this is a kind of post-release party for everyone that's been involved. And uh, everyone turns up except, uh, let me see, except Paul. <laughs> Yeah, he was probably busy. Well, he had just met Linda. He was having a bath. Um, <laughs> with Linda. <laughs> with Linda. No, no. Possibly. I mean, he famous, famously, the very first meeting that he was supposed to have, or well, the meeting they were supposed to have to sign the contract, Paul didn't turn up because he was, he was having, having a, a bath. bath. And uh, George said, yeah, well, he may be late, but he'll be very clean. <laughs> if that was in the Ruttles, you wouldn't believe it, you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't didn't believe turn it. up because he was having a bath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, into June, Procol Harum uh, have their debut concert at the Savile Theatre and Whiter Shade yeah. of Pale is at number one. And in, in a decent management structure scenario, that should have been a huge success. The band you're managing in the theatre you're managing at number one, you do wonder why Nems or Brian or somebody, because Robert Stigwood does go into the record label business, but why, you know, why they, there wasn't a record label alongside all of that. This this is Procol Harum's debut concert. I mean, it's not just that this is their first concert after they've had a number one. This is the first <laughs> time they've ever played live as a band called Procol Harum. Yeah. And they're at, they're at number one. So the single gets to number one before they played live. 
It's extraordinary. And uh, that same week, NEMS announced the Yellow Submarine film, the cartoon film that we'd know and love from 1968. So stuff is still happening and Brian and Nems are still doing work. He is involved in the preamble to the Our World TV show on the 25th of June. Yep. He's visiting the Beatles in Abbey Road. He's prepping for the presentation itself. And, uh, you know, Our World and All You Need Is Love is a, I think that could be an episode in itself, Stephen, he said. No, I like, think it might be an episode in itself, yeah. <laughs> and then by the end of June, the monkeys are playing London, they're playing Wembley, and that's all organised by Nems. And George suggests that Brian should bring somebody like Tim Buckley to London. How cool would that be? Tim Buckley at the Savile Theatre. You know, um, you kind of think he... This is all like... This is exactly like Apple, though, which is... It is. So many good ideas not getting captured. Like, so many... Like, somebody could have just flown with all of this. It does kind of, in a way, prefigure what's going to happen at Apple, where you have people... Mm. You have Except you have four Brian Epsteins. You have four individuals... Uh, you know, with their with their own ideas about w- what's supposed to be done and their own projects and their hands on and you know George is producing Jackie Lomax and Paul is is producing uh, Mary Hopkin and um, they all start to have their ideas and really what they need is someone that they can pass all of this to to say these are the projects that we think are worthwhile do a do a nice uh, risk assessment do a business case for each of yeah. these things but i said no one's doing a business case for anything it's just um all happening <laughs> on on the whim of whoever happens to be um there at the time and it's brian yeah, they, again you know brian is doing the negotiation to bring tim buckley to the uk why isn't somebody else doing that for brian you know yeah it's it's a, a, you know, again, you, it falls back to some of this is just the fact that he's a pioneer in in, yeah. in, in some ways to doing this, this this kind of thing. Whereas now it'd be totally normal that there'd be, you know, promoters slash agents slash managers and people would be, um, you know, there'd be setups to organise such things. On the 17th of July, uh, Harry Epstein dies, Brian's father. Yeah. And you wonder, you know, he's a guy dealing with an awful lot and... You, you, you again. I, I don't want to go into amateur psychology hour, but you know that must have obviously a big impact. There, yeah. I mean, you think two two very important people in his life have died. Alma Cogan has has, yeah. has died at the end of sixty six. His father dies on the seventeenth of July. Um, we leave it for other people on other podcasts to do the deep dive psychology of Brian's relationship with his father, but he spent a lot of his his kind of early years confounding his father's expectations and and, and kind of kicking it. You know, his father could see a career path for Brian. Um, Yeah. uh, The the furniture business, the retail business in Liverpool was a family business that went back a couple of generations. That was the expectation. He uh, confounded those expectations by saying he wanted to become a dress designer, then by going Mm. to RADA. And then managing the Beatles. And when he, he starts to manage the Beatles and he forms NEMS, he has to specifically say to his father, this won't take up much of my time, but if it eats into any of my time with your business, I will make that time up and I will uh, make sure. And then suddenly he becomes this massively successful mm. manager. And his, his, this band that you can imagine his father has no time for the Beatles, either kind of the music. I mean, it's just not of his world, not of his generation, not of his social uh, um, position. But suddenly he has proven himself to, to, to his, his father. Yeah, and, it's, and, and, and the organization itself, NEMS, is named after the North End Music Store, his dad's store. So... You know, the family is undoubtedly uh, important. So that must have had a, a big impact um, when that happened in mid-July. At the end of July, there's a very famous legalised marijuana ad that appears in the newspapers. It appears on the Times on the 24th of July, 1967. And it's a, one of these kind of open letter advertisements with a bunch of signatories trying to provoke or to get people to think about the legalisation of cannabis and the release of prisoners in prison because of possession and to look into um, somewhat far- farsightedly um, medical marijuana uses. And Brian is one of the signatories along with um, the Beatles themselves and uh, two members of parliament and 16 doctors and another 40 odd people have signed this thing. Um, very much a, a sign of the times type event Legalised marijuana, it's appearing in the Times, which is the sort of official paper of record, none, none, none more establishment than 
than than the times. Uh, this is around the same time as you know we have the, the stones being busted and uh, yep. uh, the articles there about who breaks a butterfly on a wheel and 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 so the, the, there's a kind of sense of social change. And the other thing that's in the air at this time is the decriminalization of homosexuality is happening. Mm-hmm. So there is just this air of social change. And Brian is sort of out front uh, saying, you know, my opinion is that pot smoking is definitely less harmful than drinking alcohol. This is Paul will echo this in years to come. He said, I'm not addicted to either. Well, but I have been very drunk <laughs> and I have been very high. I think that's a good line. Uh, and then, you know, in, in June of 67, Brian had admitted to taking LSD after Paul went on the TV um, yeah. to, to kind of admit that. The so, again, there's an element of he is supporting the Beatles in what they want to do. You know, the, the Beatles at this point are agents of social change. And I think the Beatles know this. They kind of are aware of what their influence mm. is. They're aware, um, you, you know, in 67, uh, there will be changes in, in how the Beatles think of drug taking and and become aware of their influence and how they should moderate that perhaps or take responsibility for that. But here I think this is a very good example of Brian on a personal level going along with the Beatles. You know, there's no there's no business reason for him to do no. this. There's 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 no financial reason for him to do this. He's gonna it's it's gonna be controversial, but he's kind of you know standing shoulder to shoulder with him on this. But it also shows Brian as a celebrity in and of himself. You know, nobody would give a hoot if Robert Stigwood signed that no. advert, you know. But Brian is 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 a voice. And perhaps he didn't realise how much of a voice he was. I think in America in particular, um, you, you know, he's asked for interviews as the manager of the Beatles. There was talk about him having a TV show. Mm. You know, so he... There is definitely an air of celebrity about Brian in his own right, um, or at least potentially. So you think, well, if the Beatles had stopped touring and if the Beatles started to distance themselves slightly from Brian or he became less involved, he has a career there. You know, he you could see Brian running a chat show, hosting a chat show, something like that. Yeah. You know? Oh, yes, um, absolutely. When we get into August... In 1967, the, the last weekend in August is due to be a, a bank holiday weekend in the UK and, and people are making plans. Just before that bank holiday weekend on the 23rd of August, Brian makes his last visit to a Beatles recording session. And uh, curiously, they're not at Abbey Road. They're in Chapel Recording Studios on Maddox Street in, in Mayfair in the centre of London. Um, and they are recording uh, or they're starting to record uh, uh, Your Mother Should Know. Yes. Um, so interestingly, Your Mother Should Know was Paul's pitch for the Our World <laughs> show. <laughs> it's 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 a big what if, if, you know, that you had that kind of uh, the orchestra playing La Marseillaise and then yep. straight <laughs> into Your into Mother Should Know. Your Mother Should Know. I, I mean, yes, I guess. It's Paul's attempt at, you know, some kind of conciliatory, let's all think of a song kind of thing. Yeah, I mean... I, but it would not work. Uh, no, it wouldn't have worked in that context. But you can kind of see... I mean, we're back to my theory about the Beatles delaying, uh, you know, the full impact of the uh, of, of the generation gap and the fallout. The Beatles had something for everybody. And you can kind of see maybe Paul's thinking is, let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born. You, you know, it's a kind of... No, it's trying to be inclusive of the whole world. Let's all use our memory and our inclusivity. Exactly. And what makes us human um, to sing a song that your mother would know. Exactly. So you can, from that point of view, I can kind of see. But, you know, they start recording this on the 22nd of August. It's still not finished. It's not, you know, there's, the thing about that song is it doesn't go anywhere. There isn't a kind of, it's a kind of repetitive lyric. You think this is something that they, it, it, it's a song that, I think in August in the finished version probably could have done with a little bit more work in terms of the lyrics. But yet this is something that was being pitched, uh, you know, two months before. So he had plenty of time. He's just slacking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it never struck me as single material, your mother should know. It almost no. sort of said it feels like a, a bit of a photocopy of when I'm 64 in a way. It kind of has a bit of a vibe of that often. It's a TV show song. It's a perfect TV show it's like song. like a theme tune. No, but I mean, I mean, you could kind of see that this is a song that, uh, you know, 
Silla Black could do on a variety show or oh, it, yeah. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it's not it's not a single it's not a Beatles single it's it, yeah it's one of those Paul catalog songs yeah and it kind of fits yeah, perfectly yeah. into where it fits which is is Magical Mystery Tour and they're all dressed in white tails it's and stuff. Coming it's down perfect. The yeah, it's perfect for that. Um, so they're working at, at Chapel Recording Studios principally because EMI is unavailable. They, they eventually will come back and discard that version and do it, do it again. But Brian calls in and he's there on the 23rd. And it's very sweet that he's still involved and he's still, you know, he's, he's, he's one of the inner circle and he's, uh, he's always welcome. He was never, he was never not welcome at any of the recording sessions, Brian, and he was never directly involved telling them what to do how to record it's amazing how he respected that boundary George Martin could go there Brian didn't go there he probably didn't feel he had to go there and nobody expected him to go there so this bank holiday is coming up and and you know if you're writing the movie of events there's a very definite fork in the road because Brian wants to arrange a weekend in his new uh, country home of Kingsley Hill to spend his bank holiday down there. That last week in August, the Beatles have been at George's instigation to see uh, the Maharishi uh, give a conference in a London hotel. And they are so smitten with what he has to say and so excited about the possibilities of transcendental meditation and the like that they make a spur of the moment, certainly by pop star standards, to spend that weekend uh, going to Bangor in North Wales uh, for a long weekend retreat to learn a little bit more about this Maharishi chap. Um, have you ever been to Bangor? I have never been to Bangor. I've been to Bangor uh, because my train broke down once and lovely part of the world, but it's it's quite remote. I've, I've been on the train from Bangor to, to London and um, it's right on the north coast of Wales. You know, it's probably the first big stop after Hollyhead when you come in on the ferry. It can be rainy, can be cold. <laughs> um, it's certainly not glamorous uh, or, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 you wouldn't expect an awful lot of pop stars to go there. So for the Beatles to decide to go to Bangor, they must have really been and, interested in what the Maharishi had to say. And do you know where they were staying? The name of the place they were staying? I do not. Bangor Normal College. <laughs> okay. Anyway, anyway, we we'll, we'll we'll come back to this on another on another episode. But yeah, it's always struck me as extremely strange that you you know they just decide they cancel their recording session planned for the weekend yeah. and they just think we'll head down to Bangor and they take their wives, they take Mick Jagger, they take Marianne Faithful um, on virtually no notice at all. Um, Ringo and Maureen yeah, were there, and, you, you know, Ringo, was, yeah. Ringo wasn't even at the lecture. It's just presumably he got a phone call to say, hey, this is great. Come on. Instant <laughs> enlightenment um, is, is, is yours at the, at the price of a ticket to Bangor. Um, so they aren't around that weekend. Uh, the, the intention is that Brian will come down. So they've spoken to Brian about the Maharishi. They've spoken yeah, to him about, about, about TM and he's going to come down on the Monday. Um, after his his kind of house party at the weekend and uh, kind of get initiated or find out what's what's kind of going on. Um, but in the meantime, Brian asks Peter Brown, Jeffrey Ellis from NEMS to come down for the bank holiday weekend. So this is going to be like a, a kind of house party. Um, he asks his PA, Joanne Newfield, to come along and to bring Lulu. Amazing. I'm going to ask, the next time you come up to stay, I'm going to ask you to bring Lulu. I'm just giving you... <laughs> Advance. <laughs> Advance. That's generally my default for anything. Yeah. Hey, if we're if we're going to that, just bring Lulu. Bring Lulu. I mean, that's <laughs> great. Have you ever seen Lulu in concert? I have not. I I saw her once <laughs> as a guest. Um, I went to see Ronnie Wood uh, just but not oh, yeah. long before lockdown, and uh, you know, Imelda May was the uh, was the kind of the guest vocalist, and then halfway through, he suddenly went, "Ladies and gentlemen." Lulu and she came on but she didn't sing shite oh, I've got a lot of time for Lulu yeah, I, I, yeah it'd be great I'd love to see Lulu as it happens Joanne Newfield and Lulu have prior engagements they're not able to go so so Brian heads off on Friday the 25th of August uh, down to the house in Sussex he's joined by Peter Brown and Geoffrey Ellis and Brian's a bit disappointed because he was expecting a He was expecting friend. someone else. I'm going to read this as a direct quote uh, from the um, Jack Ray Coleman 
book, uh, a young man with whom Epstein hoped to become better acquainted did not show up. Fair enough. Um, and, and this kind of disappoints him um, because he's like, well, I don't really want to spend a weekend with Peter Brown and Jeffrey Ellis, who I see all the time anyway. I'm yeah. sure they were touched. I'm sure. I, mean, um, I thought that it was very nice. You know, you could, oh, not, not only has this young man with whom I hope to become better acquainted not shown up, that Lulu isn't even here. It's just Peter and Jeff. <laughs> Peter and Jeff, God. Um, so he, he, they basically have a big, drinky, boozy dinner. And then Brian decides to um, to, to, to to go back to London, yeah, basically. Yeah, to get in the car and drive back. Um, he, uh, does he drive his himself? Convertible to London. I'm, I'm assuming he's driving himself at this does. point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but but unfortunately, unbeknownst to, to Brian, once he's back in London, some of his party people do arrive down in the country house. Yeah, no, there's no suggestion that Lulu turns up. Uh, but um, yeah, a taxi, a London. No, this is this is I think important. A London taxi. So this is this is kind of quite far outside London. But a London taxi turns up with four people that Epstein had invited, and although surprised that their host wasn't there, they just stay and uh, party on down with uh, Pete and Jeff. Um, and then Brian gets in touch. Then on the Saturday evening, uh, he rings from his Chapel Street house in London. And he's talking to Peter Brown, and they're still trying to convince him to to come back to the the house. Yes. Yeah, so what so what has happened is Brian gets home, uh, late home to Chapel Street in London late on the Friday. Uh, he has a live-in butler, uh, Antonio, and his wife Maria, um, who hear him arrive, um, but they don't kind of hear anything from him on the Saturday. He's you know in the flat on his own effectively, uh, and then at Five o'clock on the Saturday, 5 p.m., he phones um, uh, back down to Peter Brown, who says, you know, come back, come back down. Now, at, by five o'clock on the Saturday, Brown is describing him as sounding a little bit groggy. Mm. So this is maybe kind of still at 5 p.m. on a Saturday. He's still kind of hungover or feeling slightly the worse for wear. Uh, and Peter Brown says, uh, get on the train uh, to Uckfield, which is... Yep. nearby the house and you know I'll come and pick you up and don't want you driving under the influence and you think uh, get a taxi why would you get a why would you Brian get a Epst- taxi get a driver yeah, yeah you're Brian Epstein why 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 not you know why wait for a train uh, get a taxi back to your place in the country but that that doesn't happen and so the last that Peter Brown hears from Brian is that he says, you know, he's going to eat something. He's going to going to go through some mail and paperwork, watch Jukebox Jury, and then he'll get in touch or decide about what train to, you know, is an option for him to, to get down. I can't imagine there's a lot of trains on a bank holiday Saturday um, going going to the countryside. Yeah, this is an aspect of of the story that seems odd to me that mm-hmm. um, Peter Brown would be saying, get the train as you say, it's a bank holiday. There's going to be a reduced train service. Uh, Peter Brown, he's going to have to let him know what train he's actually on uh, so that Peter Brown can come and pick him up from the station. Whereas he could just have picked up any one uh, of a hire car or a, you know, uh, chauffeur. He'd get a taxi, you know, to, mm. to um, that, that this aspect about I'm going to get a train. I'll let you know what train I'm going to be on. That seems odd. Yes. The, 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 the alarm is kind of raised then on Sunday morning that um, something is not quite right because there's been no further communication to Peter Brown uh, or to anybody. And it's, it's, it's Brian's uh, butler, Antonio, who kind of gets a bit worried, first of all, because he hasn't heard anything. Yes. So they, they, they heard him come home on the Friday so they know he's 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 there they don't hear anything on the Sunday and they start to get worried and Joanne Newfield who who's the PA that that um, uh, was, wasn't able they contact her and say look uh, we haven't heard we don't know what's happening uh, she decides that she will go over now what we should say is this is not Entirely unusual. You know, she will say, you know, this happens. Brian comes home. He comes home late. Um, you yeah. know, sometimes he doesn't get up to three or four in the afternoon, has breakfast at four o'clock in the afternoon and then begins work. He had increasingly uh, over 
67, he was working from home. He wasn't going into the office and he was working in this slightly odd way where he'd be in bed dictating letters and things like that. So it's not that uncommon, but she decides, OK, I'm, I'm going to go over. She arrives. There's an intercom. He doesn't answer the intercom and uh, they, they knock on the door. No response. So this is the point at which she decides she needs somebody else to come. She mm-hmm. calls Peter Brown and said, uh, you, you, need to get, you need to get here. And Peter Brown says, call John Galway, who's the doctor. Yeah. So John Galway arrives and he goes up to, 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 to the room and it's Antonio and John Galway who end up breaking in the, uh, the, the door into the room. And um, while this is happening, um, Joanne Newfield is on the phone to Peter Brown. Yes, so this is sort of happening live. She, she's also contacted Alistair Taylor, who's on his way to the house. They're breaking the door down and she is literally holding the phone with Peter Brown on the other end so that she can tell them uh, what's happening. Um, she said the room was dark, the curtains were drawn. Uh, she could see that Brian was in bed and the doctor turns around and simply says, uh, just wait, wait outside. Um, she's standing there on the phone. A few minutes go by and the doctor comes out and she says, I've never seen a doctor so white. We were all white. We knew what had happened. We knew that Brian had died. Mm. And so this is communicated to to Peter Brown. Yes. Um, and, and and Galway talks directly to Peter Brown, uh, the doctor, to say that Brian has died. And then Peter Brown calls this figure, David Jacobs, yes. again, um, the, the showbiz lawyer, to, to, to get him involved. And at that point, then, Peter Brown and Jeff Ellis um, head directly to London and Alistair Taylor also arrives at Brian's place because they still haven't called the police. No, they haven't called the police. Uh, Alistair Taylor says that, you know, literally uh, within a few minutes of them at this point, having searched the room, having searched the house, they're trying to look for drugs or barbiturates. They're, they're, They're trying to make sure there are no illegal substances in the house. Then they ring the police. And they said literally within minutes of telling the police, there's a knock on the door and it's a reporter. Yeah. Um, and he's saying, uh, you know, what are you doing here, Alistair? I hear Brian is ill. So there's a very clear inference the hair that they tell the police and somebody in the police picks up the phone to the journalist and says, uh, yeah. you better get to, um, you better get to Chapel Street. There's a good story breaking. Um, and again, you know, this is something that happens frequently, um, whether it's the Stones bust, whether it's the uh, John and Yoko's bust, you know, the police almost arrive accompanied by the press um, yeah. because of because of the links there. So Al- Alistair is, you know, keeping the press at bay and saying, oh, you know, you know what he's like. Brian's not here. I, he asked me to come over. He's gone away in the car, et cetera, et cetera. And he is stalling um, the the uh, until, until everybody else gets gets there. Yeah, and Peter Brown recalls arriving after um, David Jacobs, who was already on the scene. Uh, David Jacobs, Peter Brown says, was holding court, bossing everyone, taking charge. Um, and then we had to go and, you know, identify Brian. And John Newfield in Deborah Geller's The Brian Epstein Story talks about how she felt Peter Brown was a bit, and Jeffrey Ellis were a bit kind of not grief stricken they were kind of there was like a mode they went into when they realized what was going on yes this is this is she there's a, there's a book um by deborah geller called the brian epstein story which comprises largely uh direct quotes you know it's kind of first-hand quotes from from the from the main actors in the story and um she has this long quote from joanne newfield uh, she says Peter Brown and I were good friends and I really wanting him to get back. I remember the first thing I asked was, why did Brian come back from Kingsley Hill? Neither of them answered. And by neither of them, she means uh, Peter Brown 
and Jeffrey Ellis, they just started to go up the stairs. And I remember thinking that they seemed weird and I knew there was something wrong. They appeared distant when I expected them to be grief stricken. I expected that Peter would give me a hug. He didn't. He was just cool. And I'm not sure that it was shock. I've asked myself many times what happened in Kingsley Hill. It's just one of the question marks I have about Brian's death. And this, I think, is indicative of the fact that right from the beginning, there are these unanswered questions or there, there's this speculation, you know, what happened? When did it happen? What is the background? Th- these, these things are, are almost immediately in, in various people's minds, notwithstanding that the press have arrived. Um, and even Peter Brown, yeah. in, Peter Brown in that same book says, uh, you know, David Jacobs, was there and he says the street was full of reporters and David was holding court. Mm. Uh, Bossing everyone and generally taking charge, David and I then had to go and identify the body uh, in the mortuary. It still horrifies me to think about it. So again, you've got this sense of David Jacobs, close friend, part of that inner circle, uh, and he's described as holding court, bossing everybody around. It's, again... What's going on here? Why are they acting in this way? Everyone reacts to grief in a different way. Is it just shock? Mm. Is it you just, well, you, 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 you have a way of working and a way of dealing with things. This is what Jacobs did. He was a lawyer. He, he's used to dealing with, with kind of the media and showbiz. And uh, that's, you, you just go into an automatic response. Well, on Sunday morning in Bangor, North Wales, Uh, the Beatles had been fully inducted into transcendental meditation by the Maharishi. They had been a payphone in the compound in Bangor and the number of the payphone had been passed from Patty Boyd, Patty Harrison, to Peter Brown. Basically, I guess, as an in case of emergency gesture. I think so, because again, you kind of think they're going to Bangor, which might as well be the other side of the world. You know, it's it's there there are no mobile phones. There's no means of communication. Uh, There aren't. This is this is a college dormitory. So just to be clear, they're staying in rooms with bunk beds. Um, It's a dormitory style accommodation. So it's like student accommodation. And there's a single payphone. Uh, and it starts to ring. And, and it starts to ring on, on the Sunday morning and it just rings and rings and rings. And eventually somebody goes to pick it up and it's uh, Jane Asher uh, that goes yeah. to answer it. And Jane Asher, uh, is it's Peter Brown who's on the other end of the phone and he tells Jane he wants to speak to Paul immediately. Yeah. And he breaks the news to them that Brian has died. And it's... Um, it was obviously shocking to them, and we have the evidence that it was shocking to them because the the footage is used in the Beatles anthology. Yes, they they they, they have a, a kind of a Paul seems to make a, a a retreat back to London almost immediately before any reporters get uh, get get all the way down to to Bangor, um, but it's kind of John who decides he's going to be the face of. Uh, the reporters, even though John, George and Ringo all go out and talk to the reporters and you can see it in their faces in anthology, they are in, in they are shocked. They are in shock. Uh, they are in shock. And Cynthia Lennon said, um, the story had already reached the British press. Reporters began to gather at the college wanting to speak to the Beatles. The press wouldn't leave until someone came out and gave a statement. Um, they all gather in a room uh, to say, who is going to do this? John said he'd do it. As you say, interestingly, Paul isn't there. Paul has already left. Paul is already on his way back to London when the other three uh, go out to answer these questions. And um, it, it's 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 the sort of worst example of press intrusion, um, mm. I, I think, because you know John comes out and he says, I don't know what to say. We've only just heard. It's hard to think of things to say, but he was just, he was a warm fellow, you know, and it's terrible. And the press go, what are your plans? And he said, well, we haven't made any. I mean, we've only just heard, um, 
and Ringo says, yeah, it's as much news to us as it is to everybody else in the press, go, why would you be without Mr. Epstein today? And, uh, you know, are you driving down to London tonight? And they're answering, you know, we don't know. Yes, we're going down. Um, what are your plans for tomorrow? And say, well, we, we, we don't know. Um, we have to play everything by ear. Mr. Epstein was coming here to be initiated. When was he coming? Uh, had you told him about the Maharishi? Uh, and it's, 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 it's a very unedifying um, example of how the press are doorstepping people, you know? It's a very harsh, yeah, it's a very harsh example of that. You can tell that they are in grief. You can tell they are shocked. And George, you know, the press already know that Paul is gone. Um, you know, George does say that Brian was going to follow us up here on Monday, and um, it, it, what's very curious is how they are all of a very certain type. Like, John is shocked, you know, we've only just heard, he doesn't know. Uh, John says, um, you know, he we don't know what to say, we loved him and he was one of us, yeah. which is a very direct, loving, truthful statement uh, from John. But also George... George is also kind of connecting to type because he's he's saying, you know, there's no such thing as death anyway. It's death on a physical level, but life goes on everywhere. Um, and that is something we know that George carried through for the rest of his life yes, in terms of yes. his reaction to death. So it's it's they they have spoken uh, to the Maharishi about this. Obviously, they, they, they've mm. uh, kind of because that's, you know, that, that question is put to them as well. But yes, George is very much already even before they've kind of gone to Bangor before they've done this. George is, is, is kind of of that mindset. And um, I, I think John's answers are very telling. You know, in that grief and in that shock, you get a very truthful, honest human reaction. And, uh, you, you know, to absolutely just say, you know, we loved him and he was one of us. That's a very honest kind of visceral response. And it, it, it more than... Anything else that probably gives you an insight into just how central he was and how the Beatles viewed, you know, that they knew he was that central uh, to, to, to their success. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it, 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 for Beatles fans, it's very familiar footage. It's harrowing footage. And, you know, pointedly in the anthology, it has this, overlay of John's voice from a few years later saying we knew we were in trouble yeah. you know we knew this was um uh, th this was a, a difficulty the 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 cause of death uh, is eventually ruled um as an overdose of uh, carbotrol which uh, was ruled as an accidental overdose a uh, gradual build up with uh, uh, alcohol in his system and certainly Paul again in the anthology says yeah it seems he sort of buys into the notion that it was a, a an, an accident there are other stories that circulate in, in in relation to to his death um brian had written suicide notes before but they 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 never really were ascribed to any particular event yeah i mean this is the, the, there's two two sources um uh, for for this so peter brown says uh he he had encountered this situation where Brian had left suicide notes before. George Martin, you know, Peter Brown, I'm prepared to be a little bit cynical about Peter Brown's account because of the general tone of the book. But George Martin, in his book, Summer of Love, very casually, in the context of talking about Sergeant Pepper, he said, Brian had attempted suicide before, but he'd always made sure the attempt failed and that the note asking for help was placed where it could not be missed by anyone. And it... Uh, you know, it's it's maybe the tone in which George Martin writes, but that is a very casual thing where you're kind of saying, "Oh yeah, I, I, this guy that I know very well and had a very good relationship. Oh yeah, of course he'd 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 uh, attempted suicide a couple of times before, but sure." Yes. And, and yeah, I, I I know you do, kind of don't want to read too much into it, and and the book is about George Martin and the recording of Sgt. Pepper, but that's a very kind of casual response to that but Brian had confronted Epstein about the notes and, and he said look I'd be grateful if you don't tell anybody I'm very sorry I've made you worry I'd just taken one pill too many I had no intention of, of overdosing and Brian seems to accept that and certainly the official the official ruling is it was accidental that he'd kind of become slightly 
foggy and had lost count perhaps or lost track of what pills he had taken he'd taken some alcohol and there was a kind of build up and and um it, it was uh, a low fatal level of barbiturate in the bloodstream and the beatles themselves don't attend the funeral um that's left as a family event uh, but george on behalf of the group s- submits a, a, a chrysanthemum a flower yes so they they, mm. they do meet they do go and they speak to uh, Brian's mother. Um, and, and one thing, again, just to put this in context, you know, his father had died um, in, in mid-July. Uh, Brian had become very solicitous of his mother. She had stayed with him in London. Uh, they were talking about by getting her a flat in London, quite close to Brian. Um, he was very conscious that as the eldest son, he, he had these responsibilities. And he had a very, very close relationship uh, with, with his mother. And that's one of the big counter arguments uh, against suicide is, you know, he would not have done this to his mother. You know, she had just lost her husband uh, six or eight weeks before. Um, but the Beatles do go and see her and... Um, in one account in the Ray Coleman book, um, it, she says to them, look, I, I'd rather you didn't come to the funeral because this is going to be a media circus if you're there. But yeah, George sends a flower. Um, now, apparently in, in, in the Jewish tradition, flowers are forbidden at, at funerals. And uh, Nat Weiss, who, who had come over from America, was also Jewish, was kind of discussing this with Jeffrey Ellis about, you know, well, what do I do? Do I've got this flower? You're not allowed to uh, to do this. So he wraps the flower in uh, newspaper and uh, throws it into the grave on top of the coffin. Um, which is kind of sweet, really. It is, it is. Um, and again, it sort of emphasizes the separateness, you, you know, that... that, that uh, Culturally and, and, you know, the Beatles, they were all part of this one club, but there were areas of Brian's life and there would be areas of the Beatles. The, 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 all of this thing is compartmentalised. So even at the funeral, the Beatles aren't allowed to be there because of the, the, the media and the press and they, they do something which they feel is appropriate, but it, it, in the tradition is not appropriate. And um, it, it, It's very much, yeah, it's very much that the everything was for the Beatles, that the Beatles didn't, go back into other people's lives you just went into the slipstream of the beatles and you 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 did it for the beatles you know that that's kind of how it appears yeah and absolutely the worst aspect of the funeral is uh the rabbi dr norman solomon wherever you are now takes ad- the opportunity to uh say epstein was the symbol of the malaise of our generation and so the, the, the eulogy or the sermon at the time, he, he takes the opportunity to kind of uh, talk about the, the, uh, the negative aspects of, of the Beatles and Epstein, and, uh, which is, you know, not nice. The postscript to all of this is that Brian uh, died on Sunday, the 27th of August. On Friday, the 1st of September, 1967, the Beatles regroup in Cavendish Avenue in Paul's house and they make an executive decision that well we've we've recorded one or two songs but we made no plans for Magical Mystery Tour we're just going to go ahead and make this film next week again the concept of time in the Beatles universe seems very strange sometimes that you know 10 days earlier they hadn't met the Maharishi and here they are Brian has died the options are a Magical Mystery Tour film or a trip to India. They choose the film first and they press on ahead instead of taking time. But what I think sort of happens subsequently for the rest of the Beatles' existence is I think they realise they they had a lot of stoppage across 1966. I think they now seem to think if they stop, they will stop forever, that they, they need to keep the kite in the air. Yes, yes. Um, and it is, I mean, looking back, uh, it, it, it is startling that, you know, within a week they are saying, right, what do we do? This is, they don't take, there, there is no sense of well, we need to take some time. Uh, we need to, to just process what's happening. We need to process uh, the grief. You know, they haven't been at the funeral. 
which is kind of part of the process of the the grieving process. They 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 there there'll be a, a memorial service in in October, but before they get to that, they're already um, moving on to the next project. And uh, you and know, you look th- at the parallel of the first of September sixty six. They're post Candlestick Park, and they they realise they have time to do different things. And then one year later, the first of September sixty seven, they should have been of the same mind that they had time, but. The, their response is totally different. Do you think that this is Paul's response? That this is the point at which, you know, we, we've said what happens in Candlest- after Candlestick Park is uh, George goes off to India, John goes off to, um, you know, film How I Won the War. Uh, they, they know they're not touring. They are starting to develop individual interests. There is no one holding them together and pulling them together other than Brian Epstein and in the studio, George Martin. One of those anchors has gone. Paul immediately realizes that there is no central figure. There is nobody in control. And he needs to get them into the next project to avoid that kind of splintering effect, to avoid everybody going off on their own in a way that Brian would have done, in a way that perhaps after the White Album in 1968, which has been a little fractious, Paul suddenly is saying, you know what we need to do, guys? We need to have a project. We need to all focus. We need to get back in. And he's he's doing this thing here. So he tells uh, Tony Barrow to turn up he comes to Cavendish as well. So he's, he's, he's got people around him. Plan. He's got the little drawing of Magical Mysticure. And this is what we're, this is what we're going to do. This is, this is, we need to, we need to get back into work for the sake of not ourselves or not our own sanity or our own processing of grief, but to keep the band together, to keep the Beatles going, to keep that on the road. We need a project. We need something that will keep us together. A hundred percent, no doubt that uh, that's Paul's response. And I think over the years, it's sometimes been labelled as, well, Paul became the bossy guy. And I, I think earnestly, it's just his response to grief or he doesn't respond well to any kind of void. And he does allude to this in some of the conversations that we hear in Get Back, that he doesn't want to be the bossy one, but he just feels the need to do it. And even throughout his solo years, you know, the day... John dies, he goes to the recording studio. It's it's just how he is. And I, I think we should be, in this day and age, more sympathetic of that, just to say that's just how he is, as opposed to he saw a vacuum where he could take over. I don't believe that was the that was the, the plan. I, I, I believe it was from a good place that he felt we will just keep busy. It's a very kind of post-war type of approach to life. Let's just roll up our sleeves and press on and... We we'll, we will get to the far side of this river, everybody. I, I I think no, I think that's true. I mean, I'm not for a minute suggesting that he sort of saw this as a a, a a vacuum where he could step in and take control. But I do think he doesn't see that other people process things in different ways, and um, you you can't have a kind of one size fits all solution to this type of situation. Um, and I think it does mirror. Almost exactly, what ha- what will happen in late sixty eight, early sixty nine? You know, you can see, you can see. I mean, we 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 talked about this about you know, Rubber Soul recording Rubber Soul, and there, there so there are there are things that 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 foreshadow what co- you know they repeat themselves. There are patterns, and I think this is this is a pattern emerging, um, and it worked. You know, give him oh, give yeah. him credit. It absolutely worked. They kind of all threw themselves into into Magical Mystery Tour. Um, you, you know, the trouble is then when you start editing Magical Mystery Tour and doing that sort of thing. But but the actual project, you know, they all commit to this, and it it does. And if they perhaps if they hadn't had that, it would have all ended in in. You know, you can see a situation where where a key member of a band dies, yeah, and the band breaks up, and I think that's. He was a key member of the band. Absolutely. this it, It's an extraordinary life that he had. That last year of his life is extraordinary as well. There's a couple of quotes we should probably um, end on um, just to, to, to think about him. There's one from uh, George Martin uh, there's a, where he says, uh, you know, he picked them. He said, I want to be your manager. I want to look after you. 
And I think that is what he did. He did look after yeah. the Beatles. And, you know, what we kind of saw subsequently is that when there was no one to look after him, a lot of people were able to get to the Beatles. And and that was not for their benefit. And, um, you know, Ringo said he was very good. He started like we did. He didn't know the game, neither did we really. We knew how to play. He tidied, tidied us up and moved us on. And, you know, he didn't know how to manage to save his life, but he decided to be a manager, um, which is very sweet, yeah. you know. Um, but he was definitely um, one of the gang. Um, you have another quote here from Derek Taylor. Brian Epstein is a crucial part of the Beatles story, a most engaging, amusing tyrant and more fun than is known, more lighthearted and witty and cheeky. And I think that is something I think about what we've lost is that, you know, the, the, the life of Brian, you know, he's Brian Epstein was younger than Yoko Ono. Yeah. So Brian would only be about uh, 88 years old today. And um, Brian, you know, you could see he could have been at Studio 54 in the late 70s. He could have been a fantastic chat show guest in the 80s. He would have been an amazing presence inside the Beatles anthology. We lost an awful lot. We we, we do. And I think that I think Derek Taylor is, is probably, uh, you, you know, he had lots of clashes with, with Brian Epstein and was fired and was yeah. quit and rehired. But 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 he says uh, he was a most engaging, amusing tyrant and much more fun than is known. Much more fun, much more lighthearted and witty and cheeky. Brian was a most wonderful chap, quite impossible to work for on a one to one basis because of his demands, but a terrifically good servant for the Beatles. And because he gave so much of himself to them, he expected people like me to give all of themselves to him. And and I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. He he, uh, 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 it's it's fascinating to think of what how he would have developed and what he would have become. And uh, yeah, you can see him sitting on those chat shows, giving good interview. Mm. Um, there's, we'll give a last word here to George Martin. Brian's death was the end of an era. Sergeant Pepper had been our best work to date, the most thoughtful among the best musically and the most successful. Brian had steered them from the dark early days of struggle and hardship through to this triumph. It was Brian's absolute unwavering conviction that the Beatles were going to be great that swayed me when we first met. His faith never wavered. He was in love with them. And that's basically it. He was their manager for five years and nine months. Got a lot done. Oh boy, that's been quite a journey. Yeah, it's a bit of a diner. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, you know, we should, um, you know, it's one of those things, you know, just we shouldn't be sad that these things are over. We should be glad that they happened. And he was a remarkable man who did a remarkable thing. Um, but what do you think, everybody? We always like to talk to you about all these issues, about Brian and his amazing uh, life. Um, we're available in the usual places on Twitter at BeatlesPod, uh, www.nothingisrealpod.com. The website is the portal to everything, our Facebook group that Stephen runs. Um, we're always happy to talk at any point <laughs> about uh, the world of the Beatles. Uh, but for now, my name's Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. Thanks for listening. 